how food affects diabetes and high blood pressure. And never in the history of mankind have human beings eaten so many carbohydrates. So let's do an assessment of the carbohydrates that Australians are eating. And no matter where I go in the world, in America, in Scotland, in England, in New Zealand, it's the same. So most people have cereal for breakfast. We know, because there's a whole aisle devoted to it, and also bread. There's a whole aisle devoted to bread. And if you go into the supermarket and see a whole aisle devoted to something, you've got a pretty good idea that it's a, it's a hot topic, eh? It's, a, it's something that a lot of people buy. And cake shops abounds, cakes, biscuits. So we'll say cakes, etc. And pies, Australians love their pies. Pizzas, Italians have introduced Aussies to pizza and pasta. I'm a fifth generation Australian Scottish descent. I didn't know what pasta was till I was about 18. I don't think there's a home without pasta today. Rice is another carbohydrate. I'm married to an Irishman, so every main meal must contain potatoes. And last and certainly least in nutritive value is the pure crystallized acid that's extracted from the sugarcane plant. Would you agree with me? Aussies are high carbohydrate consumers. Now all of these foods in the gastrointestinal tract, which I will show you tomorrow night, they break down to a singular structure called glucose. So when these foods get broken down to glucose, the glucose gets into the blood and then it goes on the main highway straight to the project manager, which is called liver. And we're gonna look at that a little bit in the next lecture. But the liver sends it, first of all, to the CBD, Central Business District of the Human Body. And that glucose goes into the cell. And when the glucose goes into the cell, it goes in under the action of insulin. Insulin is the key that unlocks the door to get glucose into the cell. It then goes through a 20-step pathway. 20 little chemical reactions which delivers to us two units of energy. The end result of this 20-step pathway is a chemical form of glucose called pyruvate. Pyruvate, as the, as the chemical form of glucose, gets fed into what's often called the powerhouse. Called the powerhouse because even though it's only an eight-step pathway, it delivers to us a whopping 36 units of energy. So what makes the difference? How come an eight-step pathway gives us 36 and a 20-step pathway only gives us two? The difference is oxygen. So this is what's often called an aerobic pathway, meaning it uses oxygen to produce energy. Whereas this pathway is called anaerobic. Anaerobic meaning no oxygen. It actually produces energy by the process of fermentation. So the first place that the glucose is sent is to the cell to be burnt as fuel. That's not a surprise. But on a high carbohydrate diet, there's still a lot of glucose left over. And so now the liver causes some of it to be stored in the cell like a little bunch of grapes, but they're little molecules of glucose. And they're stored there for when we need them. And they're called glycogen. Glycogen is a name given to quick release glucose stores. This explains why when you wake up in the morning and do your morning exercise, you don't need to eat first. You will get energy because inside your cell, particular muscle cell, there are little molecules of glucose just waiting to be plucked when the need arises. But on a high carbohydrate diet, we've still got glucose left over. And so now, the liver causes that excess glucose to be stored in the most amazing fuel depot in the human body, fat. And on this high carbohydrate diet, what's happening to Australians? They're getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Fat doesn't make you fat. 
I've just given you the basic science here. What makes you fat? It's the glucose. It's the carbs. And here we've got our pancreas. And our pancreas, it releases two hormones. One is insulin. And insulin's the hormone designed to get the blood glucose down again when it goes high. And if it goes down, if the blood glucose goes too low, then glucagon is released. And glucagon, glucagon is the hormone that's released if blood glucose goes too low to get it up again. Now what's happening with the pancreas is when the pure crystallized acid extracted from the sugar cane plant goes in, blood glucose levels rise dramatically. Not sugar cane, because in the sugar cane, the glucose is all bound up in fiber and it slowly releases the glucose. But that pure crystallized acid that's been extracted from the sugar cane plant when it goes into the body, blood glucose levels go boom. Very quickly, the brain says, Overload, quick, pancreas, release the insulin. You see, high glucose demands high insulin. And so now the insulin's released and blood glucose levels start to drop because now the insulin causes the glucose to go into the cell or to be stored as glycogen or fat. But because there was so much glucose, huge amounts of insulin are released. So where are blood glucose levels going now? Too low. That's called hypoglycemia, too low. So now the brain goes, oh no, we're too low. Stop the insulin, release the glucagon. But by the way, what happens down there? What does the person do? I need a hit of sugar, I'm too low. Will the sugar get it up? Oh, absolutely. Boom, oh no, we're too high. Stop the glucagon, release the insulin. Oh no, wait, can you see what's happening? Something else is happening. The cell starts to say, I'm sick of the sight of your insulin. And insulin resistance steps up. I'm sick of the sight of you. So the cell starts to resist insulin. And the blood glucose levels stay high because it's resisting getting in. And so the brain says, too much glucose, more insulin, more insulin. And you see what's happening here? The body says, what am I going to do with this? Get it out through the urine. You know what diabetes mellitus means? Sweet urine, because there's nowhere else for it to go. And then eventually the pancreas just says, I'm sick of this, I'm done. And it just stops releasing the insulin. As we conclude this session, I hope the insights shared today empower you to take an active role in your health journey. Remember, holistic healing encompasses not just the body, but also the mind and spirit. Embrace the knowledge you've gained today and apply it in your daily life. Prioritize nutrition, lifestyle choices and natural remedies to enhance your overall well-being. Together we can unlock the secrets to a healthier life. Thank you for joining me, Barbara O'Neill. Be sure to subscribe for more lectures on holistic health and wellness. And don't forget to take care of yourselves.